This interview was recorded on March 16th, 2020. Hi, I'm Len Epp from Lean Pub, and in this episode of the Front Matter podcast, I'll be interviewing Gabriel Volpe. Based in Poland and originally hailing from Buenos Aires, Gabriel is a software engineer who specializes in functional programming. A popular speaker at conferences and meetups, he has authored a number of open source libraries, including the FS2 Rabbit and Redis for C. Red, sorry, <laughs> that's my Emacs, and Redis for Cats Scala libraries. You can follow him on Twitter at Volpe Gabriel. One eight. You can follow him on Twitter at Volpe Gabriel. 87 and check out his website at gvolpe.github.io. Gabriel is the author of the Lean Pub book, Practical FP in Scala, A Hands-On Approach. In this interview, we're going to talk about Gabriel's background and career, professional interests, his book, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience as a self-published author and using Lean Pub. So thank you very much for being on the Front Matter podcast. Hi, Lynn. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be talking to you today. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it was like growing up in Argentina and uh, how you first became interested in programming and computers generally. Sure. Um, I was born in, in a small town in a, in a naval base because uh, my father was in the Navy and that's where he met my mother. And then we moved to a small town near Buenos Aires City and I just had a normal childhood. Uh, from a middle class family, and I used all like any other Argentinians. I, th I think we played a lot of football during childhood, growing up with friends. I still love playing football, but I haven't been playing so much. And I got into programming at age 15 when I accidentally decided to change school. Uh, my parents were sending me to a private school, and got to that point in, in, in my career where you had to choose, you kind of need to choose for your secondary school uh, or high school, uh, like a specific, uh, a specific, uh, how, how do you say it? Um, kind of like a career, right? You needed to, I needed to choose between economy or art or social science or geography, that kind of stuff. And I didn't like any of them. Um, so I decided to change to a public public school where they had some kind of like computer science stuff. And I didn't know anything about computers. I only used Microsoft Paint <laughs> to draw some graphics. And that's all I knew. And in my first class I'm at this public school when I started, but it wasn't a really easy choice because I, I left behind all my friends from primary school and I just switched to this other school myself. But first class was like algorithms and data structures. And I said to myself, what did I get into? <laughs> what, what, is, what is all the things on, on, the, on the blackboard? I had no idea what I was getting into. But then I got, I got started into programming using QBasic and C++ the next year. And, and, and then all, all the things just fitting into place. I think I really liked I got hooked up into programming with games as well. I think like most programmers, we like games, moving pixels from here to here, dealing with some gaming logic. That's how I got hooked up into programming. Uh, but yeah, I, after a few years, I left high school uh, already uh, in love with programming. I was spending summers uh, at my computer, uh, just writing programs. Back in the day, it's just going to I didn't have internet at home I didn't even have a computer um, my first computer I got it at, at 16 and didn't have internet like in Argentina I know things move quite slowly it's slowly like not like the rest of the world uh, you don't get internet services uh, so quicker so quickly and so yeah I think I, I used to go to this uh, they they were called cyber cafes or cyber cafes in Argentina. We just go there to drink a coffee and use the internet services. Uh, I was like looking for programming code, you know, like how how do I get to solve this or how do I get to draw some nice graphics on on QBasic on C plus plus using SDL later. And I, I was writing down all this code in with a pen and paper, and then going back home, <laughs> and then just like go back to my computer. Uh, and and then later, you know, we got into the diskettes and uh, pen drives as well, the USB keys. But that that came came later for me, at least. 
uh, we didn't have that kind of technology in Argentina. Um, so that's how I got into programming. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. That's a fantastic story. Uh, one of the one of the really great pleasures of this podcast is hearing about people's journey through technology, through time and place. Um, I once interviewed someone who uh, studied computer science in Crimea during a time when there was a, a you know dramatic kind of shutdown of public services, and so there was a lot of learning to use a computer when the electricity wasn't on, kind of stuff going on. And I think for for a lot of people listening, you know. Uh, there's, there's these various eras. One of them is the smart, smartphone era. And before that, you kind of wrote things down on pen and paper rather than screenshots or on your, on your like taking pictures or, or, or writing things down on your phone. Uh, and there were these things called cyber cafes, uh, which I remember very much myself, where if you, were, if, you were, if you didn't have internet at home, which not everybody did, or you were traveling in order to get on the internet, you didn't pull something out of your pocket. You like went into a cafe and you like paid money and you like maybe got a code and then you had to type that in and then you got paid for the amount of time you sat there using the internet. So uh, things, things really do change. Um, and so, uh, and so you ultimately, you went, you went to university. Uh, I, I gather, is that, is that correct? Yeah, uh, I went to uni, but I gave up because uh, I was working and studying at the same time. That is a very common thing for Argentinians. We work and study because otherwise we can't afford it. And even though I was uh, public universities are free, uh, you still have to pay, you know, to travel to uni, get, get, get your computer or get your books and get, you know, you need to eat as well. <laughs> and all of these things uh, required some money. My parents couldn't afford that for me. So I was working and studying at the same time. The thing is, I was working, nothing related to IT, to the IT industry, but I was 18 years old, finished high school got a nice job for it, like very good money for an 18 year old kid. Uh, you know, just want to go out, have your own things, buy your own guitar. And, and it was cool to have that. But then I realized that uh, I, I didn't go immediately to uni. I went a year, I let, I let a year go by and I was working, making good money. I mean, for, a, for an 18 year old kid it was good money. Uh, you know, I could buy my own stuff and that was cool. Uh, but, you know, I realized that I didn't want to do that kind of job for the rest of my life because I saw people with 10 or 15 years experience doing the same job I was doing on, on day one and say, no, this is not for me. I need to study. I need to invest more in my career. My, my, my mother was actually pushing me to go to uni. So I signed up into uni. Uh, it was actually called the National Technological University in Argentina. It's one of the the two best public universities and the thing is i was i was working during night shift so i was starting my my job uh, i was working in logistics and starting my job uh, around 11 p.m leaving at 7 a.m so working all night and, and then going to uni at 8 a.m and i was falling asleep in classes it's, it was really tough and um so I think I just gave up and left uni there, continued working for six more months. Uh, and then I, I just made myself the promise that I would continue my studies and you know, get into IT because I, I, I thought I was good doing what I was doing. So then I quit my job immediately and, and just signed up into uni again. And I was like doing some random shops like for two or three months then I, I had a period working as a dj as well and as a what sir as a dj a oh, dj okay yeah i yeah, got it yeah. yeah and cool so yeah then i started uni and then i finished <laughs> i actually graduated and before graduated uh, graduating i got my first it job for a very very low pay <laughs> Yeah, but you know you gotta start somewhere and you know after being earning my money for a year and a half in a in logistics in a different industry and then go back to an it job and earning a very low salary wasn't really pleasant so uh you you had your first job after university uh after and you were not making very much money yeah exactly so i had a I had a very good low salary but um I stay, I work at this company for like eight or nine months and then I got hired to do a real programming job because in my previous job I was like, you know, uh, solving 
computer issues from all, for other people, you know, the typical, have you tried turning it on and off again, off and on? And that kind of shop, you know, it was like in partly programming, but not full-time programming. And after this shop, I got the, another shop in programming, and, and that was where I learned a lot with other colleagues. Yeah, I stayed in that company for like two years and a half. And is there is there a is there a big tech sector? I mean, this is this was a few years ago, but is there is there a tech sector in in Buenos Aires? Oh uh, yeah, there is a very good tech sector. I think um, even what with the economy that is not great in in my country, uh, I think in if you work in IT, it's it's always good. You know, like you you can you can have a good lifestyle and you know, decent salaries, and you're not so affected like the rest of the people. Uh, that, for example, my mother works in the in the car industry, and and they get fired. You know, the the government changes, and the something changes for them. It's for us. We I think we are lucky to work in the IT industry because we we can find jobs in other countries as well. Yeah, and you uh, you eventually found your way to other countries yourself. How did how did you get started on that journey? Um, it wasn't easy, mainly because I, I had the when was that? So I got my first job. Well, first I started freelancing for some some people while I was still in Argentina. Uh, the main issue I had was English. Uh, my English was terrible uh, because mainly English, like second languages, education in my countries are really terrible. We have the same level of English from primary school, high school, and university. It's just the same, and it's really bad. Like we always learn the same, and 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 it, there's no way you can learn to speak. Uh, I was very good at writing and reading but I, I was struggling having a conversation and, and you know my, my words wouldn't come out well, even I had to translate it to Spanish first and then trying to translate it into English and by the time words come out of my mouth it's like dude <laughs> it's just like it's just terrible so um, I just decided to leave my country with a one ticket one way ticket um, uh, to London I say I'd say I had enough of, of, of the bureaucracy of my country, of the terrible things that happen every day in the economy. It's hard to save money. It's hard to invest in your own things because you know, the, 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 the rules of the game are always changing. The government changes and, and, and the rules change again. So it's a, the, this is not the place where I would like to invest in my own business or keep working here. So I decided to emigrate go to London, mainly because I wanted to go to an English-speaking country where I could just uh, become more fluent in English and learn more. And I was doing some interviews uh, via LinkedIn. And, and the first week, I, I flew to Ireland, to Dublin, for one of these interviews. Uh, and, and I got an offer. I don't know how I got that offer, to be honest, because I think I, I nailed it on the blackboard with the technical questions. But I had some Irish interviewing me, and their accent was really hard for me. <laughs> and, uh, but I was lucky enough that I was interviewed by four different people, uh, two interviews uh, at a different time. So I understood one, but not the other. And, and in the other interview, I understood only one person out of two. Uh, so I think I got lucky there. And that's when I got my first job uh, in Ireland, in Dublin. So once my visa sponsorship and all the working permits was set up, uh, I just moved to Dublin, and that's when my experience living abroad started. That, that was five years ago. That's um, that's really fascinating. I've got two two things to share that I think are similar experiences. Uh, one is that in Canada we have something called French immersion, um, where people basically end up speaking the same level of French from grade eight to grade twelve to graduating from university, more or less. Um, uh, and uh, I know I know what it's like being able to to read something. I never could write it well. Uh, but, but being able to sort of like construct your own sentences uh, is, is just sort of very, is a very different thing from being able to sort of receive. And so you can end up in this weird kind of split mind where you can, I, I lived in Montreal for a few years uh, in Canada where the main language is French. And so I would often find myself in conversations with people like me, but from the other side. So they would speak in French and I would speak in English. And we could understand each other perfectly, but if we had to actually speak in the other person's language, it was like 
what are you saying? Um, I also myself, when I was a young man, took the one one way ticket to London. Um, I had my my visa and stuff sorted out in advance, but I had no plan. And I still remember uh, being on the plane next to this this young woman who was like, I'm going to London to do X, Y, and Z, and I've got it all lined up. What are you going there to do? And I felt like such an, <laughs> such an idiot. I was like, I, I actually have not even thought about it. Like, I'm just going. Um, and uh, that is, a, that they, or at least it was, a, a remarkable place uh, to, to find jobs and things and opportunities that you can't find in, your, in the entirety of your own country. You can, you can often find them in that city. It's, a, it's an amazing place. And so you, you ended up in, in Dublin. Um, how long were you there for? Uh, I worked in a gambling company for about a year and a half. And, and then I, I decided to leave and go traveling for a while. And I, I like to travel a lot. That's uh, my other, the other thing I enjoy the most. Um, uh, but I'm now, I'm, I'm now getting at the point where I'm quite old to keep traveling like I used to as a backpacker. So uh, I'm trying to settle down now because I got my fiance now. I used to be single. <laughs> yeah, speaking speaking of traveling, so this is something I was looking forward to talking to you about. So we're 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 talking on uh, March 16th. Uh, we're in the midst of um, COVID 19 stuff happening everywhere. It's it's happening to you. It's happening to me. It's happening to all of us. Um, but you recently barely barely made it back to Poland. Uh, I gather from your Twitter feed, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that because there's a lot of people out there, there who you know are were kind of elsewhere uh, when things came down, and uh, Europe has its own particular challenges for getting around. Yeah, so in order for people to understand my current situation, I need to go back in time a little bit. So I was living in Tokyo, Japan. Well, first of all, I was. What happened after? Ireland, I went traveling to Asia and Eastern Europe for about, uh, I was traveling for a year and a half. It's like no working at all, doing just some open source. And at the end of all my travels, I, I met my current fiance and she's a Polish citizen. That's why we are in Poland now. And then I got this job in Japan. And I got a, the shop in Tokyo and I said, hey, hey, look, I got this amazing opportunity to work uh, in a great, great company in Tokyo, but we need to move to Japan. <laughs> and, and the thing is like the Japanese government is very strict with visas. So I, I would get visa sponsorship from this company, uh, but not, not her, which was my girlfriend at the time, right? So, but she was crazy enough to follow me to Japan, even though she's not a big fan of Asia. And so I came, I came to Tokyo first, and then she joined me in the second month. And she came as a visitor. She only had three months visa. And we were trying to figure, figure things out, how, how we could live together and stuff. And we found, like, you know, we were trying to avoid getting married you know, because it was like, kind of like too soon for us. And even if we got married, she wouldn't be able to work in Japan because they have this, you get this post visa. And you need just to stay at home doing the dishes. That's that's part of uh, the Japanese culture I don't like, but I don't want to get there. And <laughs> and so she came back to Europe. She managed to get the working holiday visa for a year, and then she moved back to Tokyo with me. So we were uh, we were doing well. She got a job in Tokyo as well with the working holiday visa. Uh, but we knew we only had a year, right? So. Um, <clears throat> Before that happened, well, things were were going well in my in in this company until the time when my manager just quit. So I, I decided it was about time for me to leave the company as well because uh, it, things were weren't going that well. Uh, so we decided to continue traveling, and then uh, we started our journey traveling Latin America. So we started in Mexico, went down all the way to Argentina by land. So we explored all Central America and South America. And in all this time was when I was writing the book as well, in my travels. And now we are back in Europe. We, we plan to stay somewhere here. Uh, we wanted just to move to the UK first, but um, I didn't manage to get a shop I like. And she, she had something lined up there, but you know we are reconsidering things now. And all this coronavirus stuff right now, so it's crazy. 
So we wanted to come to stay in Poland with her mother, with her family, because uh, she hadn't seen her mother in, a, in about a year. Um, and we had a we had a plane. Yeah, we had a flight booked for what is today? It's Monday for yesterday, Sunday from from London. So the idea was like we were staying in London for the last five nights just to, uh, you know, end end our trip with uh, visiting some friends in London and and because it's, we like the, the city as well, right? Uh, but uh, on Saturday, while we were just having fun in town and the Polish government announced that they were shutting down the borders at midnight. And that means that our flight yesterday was going to get canceled, but even if the flight was still coming to Poland, they wouldn't let me in because I'm not a Polish national, right? Uh, so they, they only let the Poles getting back in but not anyone else so no that was that happened on friday actually that happened on friday and um, so on saturday we had to book a, an emergency flight try to come back and we made it but it was very expensive <laughs> so yeah that's how we are in poland at the moment in quarantine oh you're in quarantine as well they're they're, they're asking you to stay home for a couple of weeks before going out Yes, but it's like I managed to come in before they shut down the, the the borders, and they had this mandatory quarantine. So I'm I'm only self quarantining myself, just as a precaution, but not not mandatory. I see, I see. And are the are the are the streets empty, or is is life sort of carrying on as normal generally? Uh, I think people are just carrying on as normal, but they are more precautious. They are there are not so many people outside. Today we went to do some grocery shopping. But, you know, being cautious and there's not so many people out there, but they still need to to work, you know, like mortgages and rent. They don't stop like coronavirus. They need to earn some money. But it, it's like all the shops, all the coffee places, hotels are shut down here. And uh, speaking of impact on industry, so like a, like, a, like a lot of Lean Pub authors, you sort of do the conference circuit and you're a very independent operator, willing to work remotely and things like that. Um, how is this how is this all affecting your prospects for the next the next few months uh, I, I think it's even making it better because it's, it's uh, embracing the culture of remote working uh, all this coronavirus suddenly a lot of companies realize that remote working uh, works <laughs> so uh, I hope we get more remote works for for other folks who would like to enjoy not going to the office, not commute every day. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting, actually. I, I, just a, I guess it's called log rolling, but um, I published a blog post the other day called five, about how basically one thing that might happen now is that we might actually see a permanent shift in the way people work. I, I sort of don't trust my instincts too much because I so much want this to be re true. Uh, but, you know, I think a lot of people might realize, you know, the reason they hate Mondays is because you've spent all weekend at home and like having fun in your community and then like getting up earlier than you have to for no good reason. And then like getting showered and like putting on clothes that you'll be evaluated on in your office place and then commuting and then getting to work. And like, instead of doing that, you get up and you like have a cup of coffee. And by the time you would have got all that, just the beginning of your day, getting to the office done, you've done as much work as you might've done in a full day at the office anyway. You know, people are going to, when, when things go knock on wood, when things go back to normal, people are going to be like going through that whole routine again, going, what am I doing? And then they get to their dumb office and they sit around looking at each other like, what are we all doing here? None of this has anything to do with work. Um, but anyway, with, sorry, with that said, uh, you, so you, uh, you wrote, a, so you've been looking for, you've been looking for a new position recently, I gather from, from your Twitter feed. Uh, and um, you recently wrote a really good blog post about your experience uh, going through through interviews recently. I was, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, about what, I mean, there were some of the things that, that you encountered that you thought really sucked. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I wrote a blog post in anger. I think some, some blog posts are, could, could only be written that way. <laughs> but yeah, I had a terrible experience interviewing small companies, but also big companies. And that was a bit, a bit, bit of a surprise for me. Because uh, I've been interviewing a lot of people, a lot of software engineers, and I think I, I ha I've, I've got some experience uh, interviewing people. I, I've been on the interviewer's side as well. And I think in my last company, we had a really good uh, 
really good uh, hiring process. And even though it wasn't perfect, because we had a lot of things to figure out with HR, with the IT department, sometimes communication was the key. And you know, some mis miscommunication between HR and the IT department, and you know, it, it was going to lead into a bad experience for the for the interviewee. Uh, but yes, I had I had terrible interview process because um, I was mainly interviewing for permanent permanent positions in in the UK, um, and yeah, so I, I think like all all the details are in that blog post, but mainly. What the, the main flow I found is like people, uh, you 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 have to uh, like you you have to go go through a three stage interview, four stage interview, and what I think it's a it's a terrible mistake. It's just to put only one engineer on the other side interviewing you, because they they become the only judge for you. It's like a very biased interview, and. Something they they probably don't like about you, or probably they feel on the defensive side. Um, I don't know how to how to read it, but I think that's a mistake. I think there there always should be at least two engineers or two persons, if it's not an in, software engineer in interview, on the other side. Because I've been on that side too, and if you are only one, it's whatever you think about that person is what matters, and that's. Ultimately, your decision, the one that you communicate to HR or to the next person in, on the chain. Um, I think if you have one another engineer by your side interviewing this other person, he might have he might might have another perspective, and at least you will you will have some arguments. You will probably discuss uh, about this interview, and you know what what do you think about this? Did you see any red flags? And uh, but whenever there's one one engineer, one person on the other side, there's not much you can do. And yeah, I, I saw many companies failing there. Uh, probably, uh, probably, of course, it, it could be my fault that I wasn't a great candidate being inter being on the interview side, but you know, I, I was left with this feeling that, it's a, that there's only one guy on the other side being, being the judge of me or whether I could be a good fit for the company or not. I totally, know what you mean. Um, I've had that experience. I think when I read your blog post, I, it brought back some memories of back in the day when I was interviewing for strategy consulting and investment banking jobs. And the worst thing was when it was one person, because sometimes they, there's a, I don't know if you know this phrase, the cut of your jib. Um, but it's just a sort of like, you know, sometimes someone just doesn't like the cut of your jib. There's just something ineffable. They don't like, there's something about you that they don't like. Um, and, uh, and it could be, and I think you mentioned this in your post that you're smarter than them. Uh, that is, this is a very real thing that sometimes people feel, um, like you might be a potential competitor in the workplace. Uh, and so having only one person, uh, interviewing a potential candidate is bad for the candidate and bad for the company. Uh, because, you know, human personalities are all variable. Um, and, uh, and there's things, things like mood as well, right? Like what if someone's just in a bad mood or what if, what if they're in a good mood and they hired the wrong person? Um, you know, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a very good, good idea to have more than, more than one person interviewing, uh, an individual candidate for all kinds of, all kinds of reasons. And it can be, it can be incredibly frustrating because you know, that just one of these reminders of just the arbitrariness of life. You know, this, I could have had this whole career. <laughs> My life could have gone a totally different direction, but because guy didn't like me, <laughs> <laughs> you know, my life didn't go down that path. Um, and so I'm uh, moving, moving on to the next part of the interview. I'd like to talk to you about your, your book, uh, which has been doing, doing very well. It's called practical FP and Scala hands-on approach. And so you, uh, so, so I guess if I would just like to begin by asking you, uh, what was your motivation to write the book? Oh, the idea started in a conference. Uh, you know, when you go to conference, especially Scala conferences, there is a great community. There is a bunch of good of folks. And you meet people, you are inspired by talks, and you get ideas. That's, that's what happened in conferences. That's why I love going to conferences, um, either to speak or to attend as well. And I got this idea when I, what was it? Um, I think I was in, 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 Scale by the Bay in November 2018 in San Francisco. 
and I got a lot of good ideas. I started, I was writing a lot of blog posts, technical blog posts back in the day and got a lot of ideas. And then in December, I went to the Scala Exchange in London. And around that time in 2018, December 2018, I got this idea of writing a book, but I didn't want to write the book uh, as, a, as a solo author. I wanted to write it with another developer. Um, so I contacted a good friend, uh, Jakub Kosowski, which is another Polish uh, Scala developer. It's also quite known in the Scala community. And uh, I talked to him in Scala, in Scala Exchange, and he said, hey, would you like to write a book with me? <laughs> and I, I only had like kind of like the idea, the topics that I want to touch on, mainly uh, writing purely functional uh, Scala. And well, it was just like an idea, I just like, told him and we we kept chatting on it but eventually uh, it didn't go anywhere because you know we were working on different things he was busy with his work I was doing with working with my own stuff and I didn't put so much effort into it um, but then so that project ended there <laughs> you know we had the topics we wanted to write on the book kind of like a tab table of contents but I didn't go anywhere. We just set up a repository and and abandoned the, this repo. Um, but then, because of the situation of my life, I left Japan. I had to quit my shop and I went traveling. And I had a lot of time while traveling. Say, so, well, why not getting back into this writing idea and see? No, maybe I'll just start writing a few chapters and, or maybe like a few sections, like and, and see what people think. And that's what I've done first. I, I wrote the first two chapters myself and with all, all, all these ideas I had, mainly design patterns and you know, like concurrent state dealing with domain data modeling in a purely functional application in Scala. So I wrote these first two chapters and I contacted a few, uh, a bunch of guys from the open source community in Scala and I, I asked them, well, what, what, what do you think about this? Like, do you think this could work? That there could be any kind of interest from from people, and they were really excited, and their their excitement got me super excited as well. And I say, well, I got plenty of time now because I'm traveling. I don't have a permanent job. Uh, I can do this. So I I think I published it on Twitter or something, and and that's what I came out. I came up with. Uh, I think some people pointed out Limpub as a, as a platform to publish your book, which is very much in progress, only the first two chapters, not very polished, but you know, like I think Limpub was a great platform to publish my book as it was. And people people that are interested in you, in the table of contents, they can sign up and and, and whenever the book is finished, they, they, they just get the full copy and maybe for a bargain of a price, because I, I published it, I think, for, for a very cheap price uh, at the beginning for people that wanted to support my work. And so that's how I started. And then I was traveling and writing at the same time. So was, the book was written in different locations in Latin America. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's just a fantastic story. And actually, I'm, I'm looking forward to asking you some questions about your writing process and stuff, because I know you've, you've, written, about, you've written about that. Um, uh, but before going on, just for, for anyone listening, um, let me be, let's sort of like start from the, the foundation. So what, what is Scala? Uh, so Scala is this hybrid language between object-oriented programming and functional programming. Uh, it's, it's been created by Martin Oderski. And yeah, he wants to kind of like uh, promote the, use, the usage of object-oriented programming and functional programming, kind of like a mix. Use the best of the two, two paradigms. Um, so that's Scala. But then... Within Scala community, within the Scala community, we have the subset of the functional programming side. Like, and there's a whole bunch of, of libraries, especially the ones that I use that I'm most comfortable using is the, the type level stack. You can mention HTTP 4S, FS2, Cats Effect, Cats, and a few others. And the, this is like the purely functional subset of this community. And I think I started doing vanilla Scala, uh, and eventually you get hooked up into the, all this functional programming thingy, and you move there, and there's no way you go back. 
And so just, just for anyone listening, let's say, let's say imagine someone's in their first year of studying computer science and they're like, wait, what's the difference between object oriented programming and functional programming? Uh, could you maybe talk just for a little, a little bit about um, Yeah. So I, I don't think I'm very good explaining object oriented programming because I kind of like forgot <laughs> what it <laughs> means, uh, but it's mainly, uh, yeah, I had some experience using Java and working for companies using Java, which is one of the main languages in the JVM that uses this object oriented programming paradigm. And it promotes the usability of objects probably to, mod to model real life things. Like for example, if you have a, a car, a, a person, these things are modeled as objects. Uh, and then logic between the interaction between a person and a car, it's also modeled as objects. Everything is an object. Um, or oh, that's, that's the kind of thing that I remember. And in functional programming, everything is it's, uh, expressed with pure functions. Uh, pure functions have a huge uh, relationship with mathematics. And I think I like mathematics as well, algebra. And even though I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not an expert by any means in mathematics, uh, but I think I like there's a huge branch called category theory as well, very much related to the topics we have nowadays in functional programming. And so, like, yeah, the main difference, uh, the main difference, I think, it's like you model everything with objects in, in an object-oriented programming language, and in a purely functional programming language, you do everything with functions. And functions, you know, have this. Mm, foundations in mathematics and, and you can reason about functions better than you can reason about objects and mutation and that's where the so, lambda lambda calculus comes in is that correct yeah that's correct i think uh lambda calculus was uh by a, was, was that created by the alonso charge in the 30s or something and i think the, the first programming language in functional programming language was lisp if i'm not mistaken somewhere in the 50s and yeah we came a long way so with so with functional programming, you can appeal to kind of like timeless universal principles of logic in a way that you can't with object oriented programming. Is that is that right? I don't I don't know whether that's right or not. I, I think that the main the main advantages of using functional programming to reason about your code is that you only have inputs and outputs. Uh, functions, you know, you get this in, you get this out. But in, within the context of an object, you might have some mutation, mutation of global state, and that's what is hard to reason about. Now, you don't do that in functional programming. Okay, okay, thanks very much for that, that explanation. Uh, these, these, it's, it's funny how these, uh, these I mean, I'm, I'm not a programmer myself, actually, I'm Lean Pubs. I mean, I do some programming and I've read some books, obviously, and stuff, and interviewed a lot of people, but I'm Lean Pubs resident non-programmer. So one thing I, I really love sort of like learning about these things. And one thing I've discovered interviewing people who are real experts in things is, is often you do forget you, you sort of like, it's not exactly that you forget, but like explaining, making things explicit that are so basic to you. I remember talking to a friend of mine who was a nuclear physicist who's like, I can't explain addition anymore. You know, <laughs> like I'm way too, I, I can't explain long division. <laughs> you know, that, that's just not part of my my world anymore uh but but yeah and so and so um who uh who is the book uh intended for uh the book is intended mainly for experienced scala developers for intermediate to advanced scala developers it's not aimed for beginners um for beginners i recommend a few other books um in 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 my twitter or in the Gitter channel of book or e even on the book these books are recommended, like Scala, Scala with Cats, or the official documentation of Cats Effect, for example. Uh, I think the book tries to fit in a space where there's no other books like this. I think that people learn a lot about functional programming, then they learn about this cool library, then they learn about this other cool library, uh, but then they are overwhelmed by by the amount of libraries and say, okay, like how, how do I put all these pieces together now? Uh, you know, I, I think I know how to use this library. I understand how this works, but how, how you know, what are the design patterns here? How, uh, how do I manage concurrent state, uh, concurrent access to, of, of data? And, and that's where this book tries to fit in. 
uh, where like you use all these cool libraries in the type level stack and then you put them all together and you create an application from scratch. Uh, like it's basically taking all these concepts, cool concepts that actually make me happy to work with into the enterprise. You know, like convincing your, your manager to use all these. Okay, how, how do you use them? Or I try to, to explain some design patterns and some common, common things, I think, like how to group your software, how to scaffold your project, and common mistakes as well. So that, that, that's where this book tries to fit in. Thanks very much for that, that great explanation. You've mentioned cats a couple of times, and I'm going to use, I'll, I'll, put, a link, I'll put a link in the uh, transcription you know, to, to explaining what, what that is, the cats ecosystem. Uh, but I wanted to use this as a segue to talking about the process of making your book. So you've got a really fun cover with a cat and a burrito. Uh, yeah. Wh why is there a cat and a burrito on the cover of your book? Uh, uh, there is a, a, a cartoon cat. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so there, there is a common joke in the functional programming space about monads. I don't know if you have heard about monads. Yeah, I interviewed uh, Julie Moranuti on the on the podcast at, at one time. Oh yeah, so, yeah. So we're we're kind of rehashing old ground for people who are like really devoted listeners. But uh, but yeah, I just wanted to give you a chance to explain explain this because it's it's so fun. Yeah, so I, I don't want to explain what a monad is because I no, no. sound like a, like a moron. <laughs> <laughs> There's many blog posts out there, but it's a, there is a very good joke in the, in the functional programming community that we say that a monad is like a burrito, right? A monad is, a monad is like a burrito. And so this, the logo of the book is this, this cat, this kitty in a burrito. <laughs> so kind of like, resembling this joke of, of a monad and it's a cat because of the cat's library and it's been created by by impure pics which is one of the amazing guys making is a very talented designer making logos for for cats cats effect fs2 and he was kind enough to let me use his logo in my book as a front cover as well he designed the cover as well oh that's uh, fantastic. thanks impure pics for that yeah 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 um it's a uh... It's really funny when I, I was I was sort of recalling this cat and a burrito joke and um, I, I I Googled it and there is such a thing. I don't know if you know this. There's such a thing as a kitty burrito, which is a way of, of wrapping up a cat that's problematic when you need to transport it like to the veterinarian or something like that. So you put the cat in a blanket and there's like a technique for wrapping it up. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know about that. <laughs> yeah, it, there's a real thing, a kitty burrito. So there, there you go. Welcome. Thank you, Internet. Uh, for everything. Uh, so yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, and, and congratulations on the wonderful cover that that's just great. I mean, and then for any, so now we're moving into the last part of the interview where we talk about where we talk about self publishing and covers are very important for anyone listening. Uh, it's worth money if you have it. Um, there are creative things you can do yourself, of course, as well. Uh, but a great cover uh, delights a potential reader and gives them more importantly, it's, it's not it's actually not a superficial thing in self-publishing because it gives people confidence that you really care about your project and you really, you know, uh, know how to show it. Uh, so that's a very important thing. And so, um, so you wrote your book when you were traveling and you published it in, in progress. Uh, were you getting feedback while you were writing it and publishing it in progress? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, so I had a few friends, uh, that were guiding me, uh, especially in the first few chapters where it was like my the first time ever I write I write, write a book. Uh, I wrote plenty of blog posts, but I never care so much about my grammar mistakes. And uh, writing a book is a different thing, so you need to be very careful about your grammar. So I had a native English speaker friend, Sean Reagan, who was helping me uh, with the mistakes, the common mistakes I was making and, and writing a book. So I think I got my, my writing got better after the first few chapters where I learned from the mistakes. And, and then the rest of the chapters were much better. Like I learned new vocabulary. I was using dictionaries online to come up with new words as well. You know, just to, to, to avoid repetition of words within the same sentence. So probably you have to you know, use different words, but it's kind of like the same meaning, but don't use the same word. And yeah, so I, I think I became a better writer. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I had I had uh, help with the grammar, with the English part, but also with the technical stuff. With the technical stuff, I had I had a few friends from the Scala community, and they are all 
uh, they're all named in my in, in my book in the acknowledgement parts but I, I don't want to I don't want to say any names because I will forget one of them. <laughs> they know who they are, but uh, great, great folks in the in the Scala community helped me with the technical part. They were reviewing the code that I was having, in, all, all the code that I had in my in the book, to make sure you know I didn't make any mistake or or maybe they they could make other suggestions as well. So that was very very useful. And I yeah thanks thanks to all of them again because they, otherwise this book wouldn't be wouldn't have been possible. And and did you get feedback from just sort of general like anonymous readers as well? I did. Once once I published the book, I was getting constant feedback by the early readers, which yeah, like that was very very useful. And and were they contacting you through a dedicated email address that you made available for them to contact you through? Yeah, so I created a Gitter channel, which is very common in the Scala community, and I encourage the readers to contact me in any any way they will prefer twitter gitter or the limpa platform or by email like whatever they prefer i will respond no matter what the platform is yeah it's, it's interesting this is where we kind of get into the weeds of stuff that's really useful for for self-published authors and not for anybody else but um so did you did you have a system for dealing with the feedback that you got like did you record everything in a document somewhere or did you did you just kind of freewheel yeah, so I have a GitHub repository for my book. So like all the feedback and questions and suggestions I have, I just created GitHub issues, and that's how I managed to to go through them. Otherwise, I would probably forget some of them. Oh, that's great. Yeah, we, we, I've interviewed a couple of people who've used GitHub, GitHub issues that way, including, um, you know, they, they'd use GitHub issues. They, they'd set up a repo not to do anything, just to get, just to use the asserted issues feature, um, which is which is really interesting. Um, and so, uh, the last question I always like to ask on this, on this podcast, when we've gone, you know, from the sort of high to the low, uh, is, um, if there was any feature you could ask us to build or any problem you could ask us to fix, uh, can you think of anything you would ask us to do that could help you as an, as an author? Um, yeah, definitely. I think, I think the feedback the feedback uh, feature didn't work in Limpup. I think I reported that issue. I think it doesn't work until today, <laughs> probably. But I think it was a weird kind of like edge case issue where it was hard to debug. But if I could ask Limpup for a feature, it would be the offer to to off. I mean, it, it, you have you, you you can sell digital copies of your book, but it would be nice if we could also sell physical copies. Is that is that possible at the moment? I don't know. No, uh, yeah, no. Thank you for bringing that up. We've and, and also for mentioning the bug. Um, uh, we, uh, <laughs> which we're, we're totally transparent at LeanPub, and like you know, that's that's important, right? We like we're insofar as LeanPub is a good platform, it's largely because of feedback from people telling us, you know, what's broken and we suck, and that that's one of the great things about having so many programmers is as customers. Um, but uh, when it comes to producing physical copies, uh, we've had this request before. Um, the, I mean, the magical ideal would be a click a button to make a print version of my book. Um, so we, we have our version of that, which is a print ready PDF output. So you can make a book and write a book in LeanPub, click a button, and then we give you a PDF. If you, if you use our, our, our writing tools, and then you can, um, uh, click a button and create a print ready PDF that you can use to upload to like Amazon or Lulu or whatever to make a print book. But uh, the answer, the short answer is we will, I mean, never, never is a long time. Um, but deal, I mean, well, you used to work in logistics. Uh, and so you know, the difference between dealing with digital things and physical things is uh, different in kind, not just degree uh, and lean pub getting into the business of physically creating books and transporting them and dealing with remainders and refunds and stuff like that is something we've thought about and we've decided not to do. So we're, we're, we're there to uh, help people get into that uh, if they want to and give them everything they need that we can help them with. Um, but we're, we're probably never going to be like buying a warehouse. <laughs> no, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, probably. It's a different kind of business. I, I, I just mentioned this because I'm, I'm in the process of getting my physical copies of my book and I'm using a different platform. And 
Yeah, actually, and, actually, and it's a uh, yeah. Let me ask you a second last question, which is uh, how are you making your print copy of your book? Uh, well, to write my book, I didn't use the Limpub mark Markdown special. I use Pandoc, which is an open source tool. Uh, I prefer to use open source tools for all I do, and so getting getting the margins and the bindings right for the physical copy is a huge challenge. I had some people helping me, but uh, I ordered the first copy, arrived in Poland uh, yesterday, so that was awesome. I just look at the first physical copy. I have it right here in my hands, I think, somewhere here. And and yeah, it has, it has a few mistakes, mainly related to margins and how they, they, they cut off the page is really close to where the page number is, or just, you know, dealing with margins is, is really difficult. It's very challenging. But now that I have the physical copy, I can compare it with the digital one that I see on the preview, and I can fix it. I actually worked on that last night, and I'm gonna make the new order of a, the the second the second proof of concept physical copy and see and see how that goes. Thanks. Thanks very much for sharing that. It's, uh, I think it's probably a really reassuring to other people who faced the same challenge before to hear that, you know, these th things like margins, you know, and have, having to sort of like get multiple test copies and stuff like that are just a normal part of the process of, of self-publishing and, and getting a print copy out. And uh, when, when it is out, please make sure to share the link with me so I could put it in the transcription for this interview, which will be online in, in a little while. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for taking the time. I, I actually uh, got to see the, a Polish sunset in the background. It's a beautiful country. Uh, this interview. <laughs> <laughs> it's dark now. Nice. Uh, but thanks very much for taking the time uh, to do this interview and for, uh, for your book uh, and for using LeanPub as a platform to publish it. We really appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invite to, to speak in, in this podcast. I think, well, I, I haven't mentioned it, but this, this was my first podcast ever. And, and so, yeah, that was a good experience. Oh, well, thank you very much. I'm a bit surprised because you did so well. Uh, and we actually, for, for those listening, we actually, it, it, hopefully it's seamless, but we had a, a couple of technical difficulties and you dealt with it like a total pro. So thank you, thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for being a Lean Pub author. Thank you. And as always, thanks to all of you for listening to this episode of the Front Matter podcast. If you like what you heard, please rate and review it wherever you found it. And if you'd like to be a Lean Pub author yourself, please check out our website at leanpub.com. Thanks.